I've got uh, my colleague and good friend Alan Pike here today. We're going to talk about the congressional effort to begin to roll back uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, one of the pieces of legislation that was put into place after the financial crisis of 2008. Here we are in 2018. Apparently all those issues are solved and we're ready to go back to the previous legal regime uh, or not. It's still playing out in Congress. Alan has been following this closely, so we brought him in today uh, for this Facebook Live to, to break down these issues, figure out what's going on and what the path forward is, some interesting political coalitions. So let's just jump into it. We're also going to take your questions, uh, but we'll give you a little bit of time to think about those. Uh, so Alan. Here, here we have, you know, Dodd-Frank, this piece of legislation has been in place for a while now. Mm -hmm. What is, granted we, we don't have time to go through all of the provisions of this, of this bill, but what is fundamentally being proposed? Like what are, what are we trying to do here? The, the single most important piece of this legislation that's moving through the Senate now would uh, dramatically revise the level, the, the size that you have to be as a bank to be targeted by the, the bulk of the new regulations that Dodd-Frank enacted. So this is as a sort of 10th birthday present to the financial crisis that inspired this law. Um, the Senate wants to quintuple the threshold at which you trigger a bunch of new regulations as a bank. Uh, under Dodd-Frank, any bank larger than $50 billion in assets had to take uh, what are called stress tests a couple times a year uh, and faced a number of restrictions on how risky their lending activity could be. This bill would take that cap from $50 billion to $250 billion, so up to a quarter trillion dollars. Basically, there were there are 38 banks uh, and, and foreign banking holding companies based in the U.S. That are, uh, that are over the $50 billion cap that face these tighter rules now. Uh, if this bill passes, uh, we'd have just 12 left. Yeah. And so what are the people who are for this? What's their argument? I mean, what are they saying about why we need to do this? Because it seems like, so far, we haven't had another financial crisis. So it Correct. seems like everything's going well. Right. Like, why don't we just stick with this? I mean, what's the argument as to why we need to start to roll this back? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of answers to that. The, the good faith reason to, uh, do, to do something like this is there's a lot of good reason to believe that there's a, a handful of banks just over $50 billion, um, but, but well under $250 billion, who are facing uh, regulatory costs and, and oversight hurdles that are more or less overzealous for the type of banking activity that they do. Um, and so for years there's been a push from uh, both sides of the aisle to make tweaks to Dodd-Frank that would benefit uh, smaller banks, community banks, credit unions, the kind of uh, language that they've been using on this stuff for, for five years now. Uh, conjures the image of like, you know, a farmer walking into a, a, a small banking office where the, the bell jingles when the door closes behind them and somebody says, hey, Hank, how you doing? And, and, and that those are the banks that we'd be helping. Um, the problem with that is that Republicans have used those same legitimate um, arguments that there's too much oversight currently on a relatively small category of small and mid-sized banks to argue for rollbacks that would also benefit companies like Citigroup. Um, and some of the largest banking companies in the world. Uh, American Express gets out from under the cap in this. Uh, State Street, which is one of the largest money managers in the entire system, gets out from under the cap in this, in this bill. Um, but the, the, the core provisions of Dodd-Frank are very costly to comply with compared to how banks have operated in the past. So the banks don't like it because they have to hire a bunch of new lawyers and a bunch of new accountants to do the math required to comply with this law. Um, and credit uh, could be a little bit smoother down at the small regional banking level if we eased some of these oversight rules from Dodd-Frank for these small banks. The problem is using those legitimate concerns as a sort of a Trojan horse um, to advance uh, a package that, that is also a giveaway to the largest banks in the system. And caught up in the middle of that contradiction are, uh, it first seemed like a dozen Democrats, now it's 17 Democrats that voted to advance this bill, that, that declined to stop this bill dead in the Senate. Right. So there's a bit of a kind of inter-party feud among the Senate Democrats. You know, you have 17, which is a good portion of the Democratic Caucus. Yeah, it's basically a third of the caucus. The Democratic Caucus. 
wh what is kind of either wh what's the conversation going on between the two sides? I mean, what's or sure. what's what's a debate that's going on between the two sides? Sure. So the the two uh, the two Democrats who become sort of the face of Democratic support for this bill, although they're not they're far from alone here, are Heidi Heitkamp and John Tester. Both of them were involved pretty early on in helping to craft it, along with. Uh, Mike Crapo, the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, the Republican lead sponsor of this bill. Um, what, what Tester and Heitkamp argue is uh, Dodd-Frank's crushing banks in our states. Uh, it's become too hard to get a mortgage. Uh, it's become too hard to get a small business loan. We could have the same safeguards, the same basic safeguards as Dodd-Frank offers, um, and have slightly looser credit in Montana and in South Dakota um, if, we, if we pass this bill. And, and we've, they, they would argue, we've crafted it very carefully so that it doesn't include a bunch of giveaways to big banks. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't dramatically uh, increase the likelihood of a new crisis. The problem is that's not true. Uh, and you don't have to take our word for it. The Congressional Budget Office, in its scoring of this bill, explicitly says the provisions contained in this legislation make a new financial crisis more likely and the next crisis when it happens more uh, severe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and so where are we, like where does the bill stand now and what's the, what's kind of the path as to whether this is going to actually happen or not? It's almost certainly going to happen. Um, I would bet a fair bit on that. It, uh, and I say that because it's already passed the only hurdle at which the Democrats could really have stopped it. Um, they, they invoked cloture, uh, Democrats declined to filibuster last week. Um, there are, there's now floor debate. It's, they're expecting a final vote, I think, by Wednesday at the latest of this week. And then it'll kick back over to the House. And most of, there, there'll be a bunch of amendments offered. Elizabeth Warren has a list of like 16 or 17 changes that she is insisting be made before she could support it. Um, and Crapo will be trying to attach a number of other things to get more conservative House Republicans on board because they then have to send it back to the House. Mm -hmm. um, the House has already passed a number of bills that include everything in this legislation and a whole lot more. Um, the House wants to gut basically every corner of Dodd-Frank. The Senate bill, which, which then shifts the political window such that the Senate bill seems more reasonable, which I think is why you've gone from just people like Heitkamp and Tester to this group of fully a third of the Democratic caucus in the Senate being willing to support it. Is there any chance that the Senate, the, the far right of the House Republicans, def deflect from this because it doesn't go far enough? That they manage to tank it, yeah. they summary it? I, uh, who, who's, <laughs> it's a mug's game to predict what the Freedom yeah. Caucus will do. Um, but I'll, I'll be the mug, I guess, uh, and say, no, I, I don't think that will happen. Uh, there's, there's no there there for anybody politically. It, the, the politics of voting for legislation like this are, are twofold for Democrats. One is it brings in campaign donations from the banking industry in an election year. And the other is, in theory, if you can play the rhetoric correctly, it lets you say, I'm, I'm looking out for the little guy. And look, I even stood up to big bad Elizabeth Warren. Um, if you're a Republican, you don't even really have that kind of a hem and haw um, vice grips that you're in. Uh, this is this is all stuff the Republicans want, um, and they've been trying to get it for six, seven years now. Basically, the entirety of the lifespan of this bill. It would be uh, sort of insane to throw babies out with bathwater at yeah. this point, even for the Freedom Caucus. I think that's probably a bridge too far. This gets uh, the financial industry a lot of what they want, just not quite everything. Okay, well, I think that uh, kind of sets the table for our discussion today, and a special guest questioner, Phoebe, joins us, and uh, we're going to take some questions. Uh, well, Phoebe's not going to be asking the questions herself, but she'll be sorting them from the plethora of responses that I'm sure have been flooding in uh, thus far. Uh, take it away, Phoebe. One question that we have is about whether or not there's been outcry. Has there been outcry from voters? What about from advocacy organizations and industry? Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of resistance to this from sort of expert advocacy groups. Um, every, pretty much every touchstone progressive financial reform or Wall Street oversight group that you can think of has come out hard against this bill. Uh, and because there are enough Democrats supporting it, their their operations, their response, their rapid response to the bill has gotten sort of muddier because they're they're fighting on two fronts. It's it's a lot simpler for organizations like that to say, look, the Republicans doing this terrible thing, um, and because this is a bipartisan bill, uh, their their messaging gets wonkier, more policy focused. They're they're trying to explain deep in the weeds of what's wrong with this bill, 
Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of energy from advocacy groups. Um, I'm not aware of that energy pouring out yet into grassroots organizing. I think that there's so much going on in our politics right now that it's probably pretty hard for something like banking reform to break through. Um, to right. become part Although of we're the doing, cornucopia we're doing our, of We're doing of our part today with this Facebook Live. So, you know, you've got you to sure. take, take that into account. But nobody's, nobody's organizing. It, this isn't 2011 anymore. We've, we've long passed the high, high water mark of populism tied to Wall Street reform in yeah. particular. I don't think anybody's going to flood into the streets over this bill. And that's, I think, in part uh, what people like Hutt Camp and Tester are, are, are counting on, that yeah. won't, they won't be made to pay for this. I mean, it's part of the overall difficulty in this Trump era is there are so many things going on sure. that how how can there possibly be attention for everything? Sure. Um, you know, we've got a major march on, on gun control coming up in a couple of weeks. There's uh, just been a huge push on DACA where we weren't able to have any kind of coalition come together. This seems to be the only thing that people yeah. uh, have been able to agree on is uh, rolling back uh, financial right. regulations. Right. Um, okay, we've got more questions. Let's go. You mentioned American Express, but which are some of the other banks that big banks that no longer fall under the purview of Dodd Frank under the new threshold? Sure. So uh, under the current current law threshold of fifty billion dollars, there are thirty eight um, banking companies that that are subject to this higher scrutiny. Again, under the higher cap, there would be just twelve. So here's some of the, the names that you might recognize that drop off of that list. Um, m and Bank, whose name is all over the Baltimore Ravens football stadium. Uh, Regions Financial Corp, who I believe also have a stadium uh, to their name. Uh, BNP Paribas, UBS, Credit Suisse, uh, Fifth Third Bank Corp, Barclays, Ally Financial, SunTrust, BB&T, this is just a sampling. So uh, you may have noticed in that list there are a number of very large bank companies based in the U.S. but subsidiary to foreign banks. It's another area that's really alarmed a lot of progressives and Democrats in this legislation is that it would seem to make it a lot easier for foreign banking companies in the event of a new crisis to evade U.S. regulation. Yes. So these, this is not a this is not legislation that's simply about you know a, a credit union or your re local or regional bank. I right. mean, these are major national right. banks that right. are now going to be exempt from. Right. The and we've really and we've really only talked about this this aspect of. Uh, the bill so far, the, the, the threshold for who is subject to this more stringent oversight. There are a number of other things tucked into this that would affect much, much smaller banks. Um, like 85% of all uh, banks and home mortgage lenders in the United States would be let out of new requirements um, governing their lending uh, in Dodd-Frank if this were to pass as, as, it, as it's presently formulated. Since the, the idea is that getting um, that increasing this threshold would be a bad thing. Can you talk a little bit about how Dodd-Frank was successful in the first place and why ultimately it needs to be preserved? Sure, yeah, it's, it's always sort of uh, difficult to prove a negative when you're talking about uh, regulatory safeguards designed to prevent something from happening and how have they worked. It, it's, it would be simplistic to say, well, you know, they haven't worked because we haven't had a repeat of the crisis in the past 10 years. Um, the, the meat of what Dodd-Frank tries to do is to require the largest banks and financial companies to be a little bit less messy, a little bit less risky in how they conduct their business. Um, and to ensure that if, when, when the risks they do still take, uh, cause somebody to fail, cause somebody's balance sheet to go underwater, uh, that taxpayers won't be on the hook for bailing them out. Uh, that's the sort of central selling point to voters of Dodd-Frank back in, in 2010, is that it's a, it's a bill to end bailouts. Um, by its nature, there are a bunch of provisions in Dodd-Frank that we won't know just how, just who was right on the detailed arguments about, you know, this or that piece of financial regulation nitty-gritty un until there is cause to use them. So until we have another massive wave of bank failures, um, we won't know exactly how successful Dodd-Frank has been, but it's pulled a lot more uh, uh, liquidity into banking. It's made bankers less able to gamble with somebody else's money, effectively. Uh, it's required uh, lower and lower what are called uh, amounts of leverage. You have to use, you have to have much more uh, 
equity on hand on your own books to back a given deal uh, rather than financing trades using debt, uh, which is a huge part of what made the crisis that we did have 10 years ago spill over from the financial industry and start to sort of seep toxic ooze into the rest of the economy such that you know your uncle or your grandma or whoever lost a job that theoretically should have been safe from the vicissitudes of Wall Street. Right. And, th and these kind of regulations just inherently are designed to prote protect against low frequency events. So right. normally you're okay with tons of leverage because the money keeps because you right. know the money is flowing in and you have you have expectations about right. okay in the next month we're going to get new funds in and so therefore we don't necessarily need to have a big cushion because right. it's not just going to shut down. The problem is if you do have an unlikely event and you don't have those reserves, you're not able necessarily to withstand it, and that's what happened in it with the bailouts in 2008. So it sounds like what we're doing is going back to a place where we're going to be a little less worried about something, yeah. these low-frequency events. Yeah, and that, that tends to be the cycles of financial regulation as politics and as policymaking tend to uh, mirror those of the financial industry itself. The crises are part of the cyclical life of the financial industry. Uh, when, when the financial industry is coming along and everybody's debt leveraged bets are paying out, somebody in Washington will inevitably stand up and go, I think we should deregulate some of this stuff. Everything seems fine. Um, and then when a crisis hits, uh, especially one, the magnitude of that which began 10 years ago, uh, you get a wave of people saying, hang on, hang on, we should put some of these rules back in place. But, but the, the, the regulation that we are now rolling back was itself a sort of partial reinstatement of some ideas that had been stripped away in the late 1990s, uh, again, on a bipartisan basis, because deregulation tends to be bipartisan, because there's so much banking influence in our politics. It's very easy to throw together a coalition across traditional ideological divides on behalf of the largest banking companies in the country. Yeah, and people can make money off of deregulation. There's sure. not a lot of money in, sure. the, in the regulation industry. Yeah, and, and right, and only a few people make money <laughs> off of off of new regulation. There's the, there's there's the law lawyer, firms and the there's lawyers, accounting yeah. firms that, the that are and, the accountants, yeah. and and they have to play both sides because <laughs> they know their clients hate it. But yeah, yeah. Okay, let's take uh, maybe one more question or two. Yeah, this is the last question we okay. have. If the federal government gives big, big banks all this leeway again, is there anything that can be done at the state level? Does it look like any governors or state legislature are poised to make any moves in response? No, I'm afraid is is the the short answer. There may be small marginal uh, uh, incentives or disincentives that that state governments and state regulators can set. Um, certainly, state governments and state elected officials play a, a hugely important role in uh, accountability on the back end when uh, the financial industry breaks the rules or breaks the law. Uh, states attorneys general were hugely important to building the evidence for. Um, Things like robo signing and other abuses in the in the foreclosure crisis that followed the initial housing collapse, um, but as far as prudential regulation, as far as rules to try to make things harder, make it make it harder to cheat the system, that's almost entirely a federal game. Uh, the 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 banking industry is uh, has to be able to work across state lines, has to be able to work across international lines. The bo the governing bodies relevant to how banks behave are almost all federal and international. Okay, great. I think we'll just uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, we're going to be covering this. Alan will be covering it uh, throughout the week or however long uh, this takes. Uh, we'll have some other great coverage on thinkprogress.org. Be sure to point your internet browser to that URL. Uh, and we'll be back next week with another topic.